Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Dr. Gil Salazar. I'm an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at UT Southwestern and the Section Director for EMS Education for the organization. I'm so delighted to be here partnering up with Health Scholars and Career Cert um, to bring you an honest opinion uh, about the future of VR and uh, discussing a little bit about some of the new training tools uh, shared to us uh, with us by uh, Career Cert and Health Scholars. I would like to uh, introduce the panel and we'll go in order um, my screen as, as I have them. And I would like for you to tell us your name and uh, what you do and kind of what your interest in, in EMS is. And we'll go from there. First on my list, I got uh, Mr. Chris Thompson, whom I know very well. Chris. Good morning. Uh, as Gil said, my name is Chris Thompson. I'm one of the EMS education faculty uh, that works with Gil. Um, I educate for four fire departments in the Dallas Metroplex with about 600 firefighters, paramedics in that group, and uh, been working with uh, Gil for about the last 11 years in education. Chris has been a really good teammate over the years and a really good friend. Really glad you could join us, Chris. Uh, next on my screen, I got Mr. Greg Childress. Greg? Good morning. Thank you, Gil. My name is Greg Childress. I'm a recently retired division chief of training in EMS for Los Pinos Fire Protection District. I did 20 years in emergency services across a variety of organizations from Metro departments to rural Colorado. And the last half of my career, I got into being an instructor all the way to uh, course coordination and standard certification teaching such as EMR, EMT, VLS, and ACLS. Thank you, Greg. It's been a pleasure working with you. So far, I look forward to uh, working with you uh, in the near future again. And uh, last but not least, I have uh, Dr. Kathleen uh, Adelgaze. Kathleen? Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Children's Hospital Colorado in Aurora and the uh, associate pediatric medical director for a couple of local EMS agencies here in Colorado, one rural and one uh, local uh, suburban in the Denver metro area. And I'm primarily an EMS researcher and educator and I uh, have uh, been involved in primarily simulation training of EMS. We have a mobile simulation trailer and um, was um, uh, invited to participate given some of that background in um, some work where I've done on simulation and other cognitive training for EMS. It's been an absolute pleasure working with Dr. Adelgay so far. In uh, the short time that I've known her, I've learned a few uh, things that I'm going to adopt into my uh, educational endeavor. So thank you so much for, for being here. For the purposes of this uh, webinar, I'm going to call everybody uh, by their first name. Uh, we're friends here and uh, our audience today really expects us to for this to be an honest conversation. So let's make it uh, amongst uh, friends. So let's get started. Um, I'm so excited about this opportunity. I've been a, a big tech geek for a long time. And when the opportunity came along to look at this technology, I, I couldn't help it uh, but to jump on it and, and, uh, and see how I could adapt it into our practice. My first question is going to be uh, for Dr. Adelgaze. Kathleen, uh, what challenges um, have you noticed in, in terms of EMS education, especially with the pandemic here within the last year? Yes, I, I think that our, the biggest thing that we discovered um, here locally and then nationally with some work I've been doing that's been grant funded by HRSA um, is that we had planned for uh, simulation training and also um, testing with simulation to kind of look at how um, training and the role of a pediatric emergency care coordinator has improved or impacted um, EMS care of kids. And we had to put a lot of that on halt because people couldn't be in close proximity to one another. Um, and when you are gathered around a small mannequin or even a large mannequin, you are definitely within six feet. And um, given that our uh, EMS professionals have to go and work in that capacity on a daily basis, um, the opportunity to be socially distanced when they are not clinically working was a, a high priority. And so it really has put a lot of the opportunity for ongoing refresher training on hold. Um, I think that uh, some EMS agencies are coming 
out of that uh, component. But then again, you will find that their skills may be rusty because they haven't had a chance to kind of do their practice and refreshers the way that they normally would be doing. Thank you. And I absolutely love how you have adopted um, the new way of referring to our professionals and clinicians out there, EMS professionals. I really, really like that. Uh, Greg, you have um, worked with, uh, worked in, in a different environment than, than most of us who've worked in uh, kind of the urban setting for the majority of our time. Tell us a little bit about the challenges that you have noticed, uh, particularly in, in the setting of EMS education and the types of uh, places where you've been. That's correct. So um, the last 12 years of my career were with Durango and Los Pinos, both of which are combination organizations and utilize a fairly substantial volunteer contingency. And one of the big challenges with volunteers is the availability of training on their schedules. Uh, you almost never have the ability to have all your volunteers in one place and at one time. And this was uh, prior to social distancing requirements. <clears throat> so um, the logistics of trying to put together multiple repetitive trainings to be able to allow all your volunteers access um, can be quite daunting, uh, especially when you're doing scenario-based trainings. Greg, and folks like you, educators like you are really the heroes. Uh, we thought we have it some tough sometimes uh, in urban areas, but uh, kudos go to folks like you for making it happen. Uh, Chris, uh, you have worked uh, with me for a long time. And one of the challenges that you and I face is uh, we got such a, a large pool of uh, EMS professionals out there and is really one, one of you. So particularly with the pandemic, how has this challenge kind of affected you personally and your practice um, in terms of education? So it's, you know, obviously on the, on the continuing education side, you know, uh, most of us do that uh, in a station or in a training center or in a training room. And again, you're, you're talking about social distancing, you know, in a few of my departments, it was, you know, it wasn't an issue because um, they have a, an auditorium, essentially, they can seat over 100 people. And if you're bringing in 15 people at a time or 16 people at a time, obviously everybody can spread out. Uh, but uh, like Dr. Adelgaze was saying, if you're trying to do hands-on skills, you still have the issue of, you know, staying with staying outside of that six feet. And so, you know, when you're doing live CE, you still need to be able to have that interaction. And, and, and Zoom is good. It was, um, it was a stop gap that we were able to use uh, in order to fill that emergency need, but it, you still lose that connection with your, with your audience. And it's really hard to engage a group of, of individuals that are either sitting in a fire station room or an EMS room and try to get everybody to interact where it's where, when you're sitting in a, in a training center with them, I can, pick on them and say, Gil, I need you to answer this question or, you know, so on and so forth. And it's a little bit harder when you're doing that with a Zoom situation, especially when you're um, out where I am, I live in the country. And, um, and sometimes you're dealing with issues of your internet. And, and I was fortunately, I was able to upgrade my internet right before the, the pandemic really took hold here, but it's still a, it's still a, a hurdle that you have to deal with. And so you're starting to talk about the, the overall infrastructure of the departments and the individuals doing this. Thank you, Chris. Uh, certainly, all of us have faced uh, challenges in terms of both initial and continuing education. One of the, uh, the items that's uh, kind of near and dear to my heart that I actually learned from, from Kathleen is uh, the concept of uh, escalation variability. It's sometimes very difficult to replicate um, with a mannequin, for example, really how sick a patient may be and we can give them scenarios, et cetera. But sometimes, uh, the appearance of a patient and the dynamics of the room are, are just so different and can be difficult to replicate. What challenges have you faced in terms of being able to reproduce this type of environment? So I think one of the things that we've discovered and there's been a variety of, um, of pediatric EMS educators and researchers who've really been looking deeply into um, how um, EMS professionals are able to kind of detect cause, um, detect recognition of the um, degree of, of what is going on with the child. And that's particularly true in respiratory distress. Um, a publication by Dr. Schroeder, who's now at UCSD, has shown that 
um, and doing some uh, kind of video, even with audio of uh, breast sounds, recorded audio of breast sounds, EMS professionals were able to identify um, the, the severity of their distress, but not necessarily the cause. And when that happens, they can't necessarily land on the right algorithm or the right protocol for care. So um, a lot of the uh, you know, opportunities for training and education um, can revolve around some feedback, um, you know, not, you know, getting the opportunity to see a condition or a case um, and then see a pattern and then make a decision and then receive feedback. And we've done that with child abuse um, recognition, bruises and burns, cutaneous injury in kids, um, and have found that we were starting to see a, a clear learning curve improvement on that recognition of the cause of the burn, the cause of the bruise, whether it was abuse or whether it was accidental or non-abusive in nature. Um, and there are real challenges in helping EMS professionals figure out uh, and, and differentiate on some of those subtle nuances between uh, different kinds of clinical situations that they don't run into very frequently and that don't mirror what you commonly see when you're you know, taking care of adults, which are about 90% of EMS encounters. Thank you very much. Yeah, certainly recognizing the acuity of a patient, um, particularly with a mannequin, sometimes it even just case-based, you may come up with some really good scenarios, but determining the acuity is, is really difficult so Greg, um, you're, a, you're an innovator in terms of, uh, of education and I've learned from you in the short time that I've been with you. Um, how can virtual reality uh, close that gap when it comes to this escalation variability uh, in training? How do you foresee we can use virtual reality to, to close that gap? Absolutely. Uh, so in the EMS, um, one of the biggest challenges we have as opposed to say hospital-based trainings is the environment that we work in. And uh, the mannequins, while they can get uh, pretty high fidelity, um, that's just one element in the equation. And so um, as Kathleen alluded to, there are oftentimes clues in the environment that um, can lead you down a certain assessment path or an investigation path. Um, and in a hospital, a patient's gonna present to a clinician everything that they can bring into the hospital, their person, their story, what have you. What we find in EMS, oftentimes there's a story that they don't bring in to the hospital, that they, um, they may not um, tell the doctor that they've been taking their wife's uh, prescription medication for the, for back pain. Um, but we happen to see that pill bottle on the nightstand. Um, and so all those elements to the story that go into that situation can be recreated in a virtual environment that from a logistics standpoint, um, to do in a real world environment as a trainer, particularly in smaller departments is almost impossible. The other thing that virtual reality presents that can help our, our, pract our practitioners perform better is to deal with the challenges that we have to deal with in the real world, such as poor lighting conditions, um, loud noises and distractions, um, a barking dog, a disruptive family member, um, small spaces, that we have to operate in bathrooms and, and small bedrooms and mobile homes and all those things that uh, a mannequin just doesn't present. It's the environment that really changes in our world. Greg, you know, the rural environment to me is a part, particularly a focus uh, and a big challenge where I think we have a, a really good opportunity to use uh, technology to really bridge that gap in, in acuity. You know, they may not see the, uh, the types of uh, conditions on a frequent basis, uh, or in, when they have to deal with it, they may need to deal with patients for a prolonged period of time in training them is, is a particular uh, challenge in my opinion. Um, we're gonna show you a uh, clip here shortly. I have one, uh, one item for, for Chris. Uh, Chris, you and I have discussed on, on many occasions that to some degree in EMS, there's a bit of a stagnation um, in, in training, um, sometimes hesitation, budgetary 
uh, mostly. Um, and so do you think, Chris, that, that VR has the opportunity to, um, to gain acceptance in, in the EMS community in the near future, or are we several years away from being able to adopt it? Again, if your if your budget allows it, I would say that it should be introduced as you know as quickly as possible. And I think this pandemic has really kind of brought that to light uh, with the lack of uh, contacts in the clinical environment. And you still have to give these students either in initial education or continuing education, you still have to give those give them those exposures. And so you know, if when these students are coming out of school, there, there's some significant deficits that are, that are being noticed. Um, you know, and unfortunately it's now passed on to the departments to basically retrain them after their training, which is, which is kind of a, a significant deficit because you don't, they may not have the field training officers to do that. So if you have the ability to utilize VR to, you know, kind of give them those exposures and, um, you know, like they were talking about, you know, with the high fidelity mannequins and everything, they're great. But when you can make that quote unquote real world environment uh, apparent to them through VR, I mean, those those opportunities are, are going to be golden. And uh, and so I think if the if you can get the, the administration to wrap their minds around the cost of this and just say, hey, look, you know, this is something that's valuable for not just now, but in the in the future. And if we ever have another issue where we have limited clinical space or limited, you know, clinical exposure or just limited exposure in general, uh, look at the value in this. Because if that person or persons encounter this in the field, th they've done more than just play with a plastic mannequin. Now they've actually kind of, quote unquote, faced it and, and seen the challenges, like Greg was saying, you know, being in a mobile home in a small bathroom or, you know, whatever. And it just makes it better. So the three of you have mentioned uh, some real significant applications in the real world. And uh, Chris, the, uh, the ability to bring this type of technology to our modern learners who really demand a multimodal way of, of education and you know, doing it PowerPoint alone or mannequin alone is not gonna, gonna cut it. Um, that's going to be a, a necessary component of, uh, of being a leader going forward in EMS is adapting this technology. Uh, to and adopting it in the interest of keeping the modern learner engaged in immersive environments. I would like to uh, share a clip uh, with you. And so, Danielle, if we could queue up uh, the first one that we have to show in the environment, uh, one of the algorithms should be the first one on the list. And then I'm going to get the, uh, the group's uh, input on it. Because it's important to optimize the space for patient care, let's learn about talking in VR while optimizing the room. First, it's kind of dark in here. Ask Aaron to turn on the lights. Aaron, please turn on the lights. Sure, I'll get the lights. That TV is pretty loud. Ask Andre to turn it off. Please turn off the TV. Right, I'll turn off the TV. That's incredible. Um, when I had a chance to, to play with this, uh, with this demo. I was absolutely astounded with the level of immersiveness and the ability to engage uh, the environment. And I can't help but be excited about uh, just what VR can do for us in terms of EMS education. And this is just ACLS that we're talking about. Um, Kathleen, I wanna ask you, um, what, what are your immediate thoughts uh, in terms of uh, setting a scene for, for uh, an EMS encounter. Uh, you spoke about the uh, difficulty with recreating environments and not recognizing acuity. How important is uh, setting the scene uh, around a specific case, in your opinion? How do you build that into your simulation um, technology? You know, I think um, that is one thing that we've really struggled with in, in terms of being able to do. Our simulation lab is actually kind of modeled as an ambulance. And so the reality about the way we've done it historically is we already have the patient out of the home and in the ambulance. And to be fair, I think that a lot of uh, the teams that we've worked with do comment that sometimes they don't even get into the home because the parent um, who is terrified about um, their child is beating them at the door and kind of throwing the child into the arms of the uh, EMS professional who's responding. So 
there is some reality to that, but, um, but I think that we really struggled with that. And, uh, and sometimes you find yourself using language, you know, um, a, a term I've, I've heard used before semantic anchoring, where you use a kind of word to give people an impression about what is going on that will automatically drive somebody directly to a thing that they have in their mind when they hear that word. And that's very different than what they physically see and how they, um, you know, unbiasedly interpret what's around them in that kind of clip that you just showed, a, a room that's dark and everything else. And then they are interpreting what they need to do as opposed to the room is dark, you know, and uh, and then they say, oh, I want the lights on. So I think that, um, that you know, having an opportunity to physically look around is, is the Oculus clip was showing that you can look up and see a ceiling fan. You can look over there and there's curtains. Um, you don't have to use language to drive people to something and you give people more of an opportunity to see and do what they would naturally do in that environment. I think that's really important. Thank you so much. Yeah, the use of semantic training uh, is absolutely paramount if you want to create uh, an environment that is going to be very productive in terms of driving a point across um, and uh, simulating a lot of the nuances about a scene that are very difficult to replicate otherwise. Greg, I'm, uh, I'm curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts on uh, just this, this clip specifically, the demo and overall in terms of uh, recreating environments. Absolutely, uh, and uh, uh, not just the ability to recreate environments, but the, the limitless possibilities of environments to create. When we're doing training, uh, at uh, at um, our stations, we, yeah, we have bathrooms and we have bunk rooms and we have a training room, kitchen, uh, but it's it's pretty limited as far as trying to create a realistic environment. And so, as Kathleen alluded to, you, you're verbally having to prompt them ahead of time. Okay, pretend this classroom looks like a living room in a mobile home, and. It doesn't take very long before that concept has, has left their mind. Um, and so the ability to create all of those, those environments and the limitless number of environments that could be created um, absolutely gets me excited about the possibilities, um, as well as the, the variability of patients themselves. Um, whoever we pick, to be the patient, um, uh, we, we don't have a lot of octogenarians that, that work in, the, in emergency services. And so we have to pick somebody that's, that's a middle-aged person and go, okay, pretend this person is, is 82 years old and having a stroke. Um, and it just really does not create that sense of immersion. Thank you, Greg, fully agree with you. Fully agree with you. Chris, when um, you viewed the, the demos, got a chance to, to play with it, my, uh, my question to you is, does, um, does the technology, does the demo provide it? And is, is it a fair representation of what's really happening um, in, in real life, say in an urban environment? Uh, is it pretty applicable to, to your practice? Sure. Um, I mean, it, it should be uh, because in these urban environments, you're going to, you know, like this one, you're going to be walking into, a, you know, some sort of, you know, residential home. The, the furniture may not be quite as clean and, and well kept as that room was, but, uh, you know, the overall encounter is going to be fairly similar to that where you have, you know, a couch, a table, a TV going, you know, lights off and things like that. So, um, sure. I think it's, you know, it's a fairly decent representation. Um, and then, you know, and the challenges that you could build into that to, you know, that you may face whenever you're on an actual scene. The, uh, one of the, the coolest things about it is that, uh, you know, the, the makeup of, of the crew and yeah, granted, not every EMS agency will be able to have five or six uh, EMS professionals on site where you can, uh, where the team dynamics are really, really phenomenal. You may be just two or three of you, sometimes even just one. But I really like uh, another you know, workflow um, that this environment allows you to to practice in. Yeah. Uh, speaking of a uh, workflow, um, uh, Greg, I want to pick on you uh, a little bit. Um, 
how how would you utilize this technology in in your day to day uh, practice educationally? How would you deploy it in terms of a, a workflow? Well, it, it provides the opportunity of basically on demand uh, since this is a, a independent uh, standalone system. VR um, provides the opportunity for folks not just to practice. Um, the ACLS or, or uh, in this example, ACLS algorithms, but actually gives folks an on-demand opportunity to practice team dynamics and crew resource management. Um, one of the things that I loved uh, when I did the demo, this particular program, was that it was all voice command. And so people actually get the opportunity to practice assigning tasks um, to specific people. We say all the time, specific, uh, specific directions get specific results. Ambiguous direction gets ambiguous results. That needs to be practiced as a, as a lead on these uh, medical calls. And so using voice in VR gives somebody the opportunity to practice crew resource management by specifically, as we saw in that clip, Andre, turn off the television as opposed to, hey, somebody turn off the TV. Um, and we all know that uh, that story of somebody and nobody. So um, I love the fact that it brings more to the table than just sitting down and, and reviewing your ACLS algorithms. This would make for a, a far better learning experience for our learners, uh, utilizing your time way more, more efficiently. Uh, Daniel, let's queue up the, uh, the stable tachycardia uh, clip where they're actually performing a little bit of, uh, of uh, some clinical uh, procedures. And we see a little bit of that, uh, those team dynamics as well, which I think is absolutely paramount for the next generation of, of learners. And Greg, you absolutely nailed it. Is direct communication call your team uh, member by, by name with a direct command um, demonstrating leadership within uh, within the scene. So we'd like to show you a clip um, of um, what it's like being in this environment, actually practicing the medicine. Mr. Nelson is a 65 year old man. We received a call that he was dizzy and laid down here. We hooked him up to the biphasic defibrillator and have a bolus of normal saline going. You can see his rhythm and he has a pulse. How should we treat this? Aaron, let's administer adenosine. I'll administer adenosine. Please restate the instruction and include the dosage I should give. Okay, uh, Aaron, let's give him six milligrams of adenosine. Giving adenosine six milligrams. <laughs> Whoa. All right, the adenosine is in. All right, looks like that didn't work. Uh, Aaron, let's give him 12 milligrams of adenosine. Giving adenosine 12 milligrams. That's phenomenal. That's pretty exceptional. And when I was practicing, I actually deliberately made mistakes within the, uh, the environment to see how the environment reacts to, to you as a learner uh, going in the wrong, wrong direction. And the kind of uh, feedback that, that you receive is, is both immediate and, and very, very effective. And then when you do the right thing, the, uh, the reward is, is, uh, is pretty immediate as well. So I really like that the, uh, this virtual environment allows you the opportunity to, to practice both when you're doing the right thing and when you're not doing the wrong thing, how you get that feedback. Uh, cognitively uh, front-loading, uh, Greg or Kathleen, uh, we discussed it at our, our meeting uh, last week, and I believe it was you, Greg, that talked a little bit about uh, cognitive uh, front-loading. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about cognitive front-loading and where that comes into play in uh, EMS education. Sure, and again, especially in the in the rural environment where um, you're dealing with smaller agencies and, and particular volunteers, where um, your time, when you actually get physical same space time with those volunteers um, is even more valuable. And you, you wanna be as efficient as possible as an instructor, as a facilitator with those volunteers and be respectful of their time. And a lot of times, particularly with initial trainings, we're, we're, we spend a lot of our in-person time or time together 
covering material that they, if they had a mechanism, could learn on their own and to prepare them so that when we get together in real time, real person, we can jump right into more of the psychomotor realm and do some skills practice. And so if we can teach them terminology, anatomy, physiology, those kind of things, particularly in a way that's, uh, uh, dare I say, fun and entertaining, um, that's going to make our actual in-person time that much more valuable. So I see VR being um, a way to actually improve the efficiency and value of in-person training. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate it. Kathleen, uh, last week, um, we discussed the, uh, the concept of, of deliberate practice uh, when it comes to EMS education and kind of the role of, of VR uh, in this concept. Can you talk a little bit about deliberate uh, practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was first introduced to the concept of deliberate practice uh, by a couple of uh, researchers who um, out of Canada and uh, New York who were working on um, training people to read radiographs and developing an opportunity to kind of look at a series of radiographs and identify whether they thought they were normal or abnormal. And then the big point of that is that you get immediate feedback and you get immediate feedback whether you're right or you're wrong. Because I think when a lot of us do a test and we get an answer right, but we don't know why we got it right, there's not a lot of learning in that. And so um, I worked with them to develop a different platform for that. Um, the benefit of, of being able to do a skill and get immediate feedback and then immediately go back in and repeat that skill helps build up your ability to start to recognize patterns and really solidify that information cognitively. Um, so it's um, in some ways you can do deliberate practice in a psychomotor skill where you do something and you're told whether you're doing it right or wrong or why don't you angle that a little differently and get feedback and then do it again. But in the case of um, being able to repeat certain conditions or certain cases frequently, you're really building um, a, a clinical experience or a knowledge base that would really take years and years to be able to develop. You know, the number of radiographs you interpret, the number of uh, certain kinds of conditions you treat um, in emergency medicine, um, both in the emergency department or the pre-hospital environment, you know, you only see a certain kind of condition with so much frequency. So deliberate practice gives you the opportunity to just do a, the same thing frequently over time and get years of experience of a certain condition in a matter of hours. And um, in the case of virtual reality training, uh, it, the same is there. You, you, make a, you make a decision about an algorithm and you get immediate feedback, that's right. This is you know, a um, unstable bradycardia and therefore you should do this. Or actually this is uh, unstable bradycardia and you actually need to do this. So, um, so that immediate feedback I think is really key and that's kind of the, the main focus of what deliberate practice is. And it's been found to be quite effective in doing that skills training for certain conditions. So right off the bat uh, with this specific module in, in VR, now we have a mechanism to uh, incorporate uh, cognitive front loading into how we educate the modern learner. And it also gives us the ability to really do deliberate practice and utilize it very fruitfully um, in a learning environment as well. And I think the modern learners are going to benefit greatly from it. I would like to uh, show you uh, a little bit of a clip on the pediatric emergency uh, assessment. So Danielle, let's uh, queue up the one, uh, just kind of showing the, the room and maybe the one with the mom and, uh, and our patient showing our, our uh, education uh, track board there on on the back that would be that would be amazing and then I have some uh, questions for for the panel the patient is two years old his respiratory rate is 42 his heart rate is 160 and his BP is normal let's see if he's consolable so this is where we're checking his interactiveness and his consolability both Well, 
once again, I'm, I'm very impressed with uh, the, uh, the realism of the environment. I really like uh, that we incorporate some aspects of the scene that are very hard to do with, with a mannequin, the ability to, uh, to have mom there demonstrating how consolable or not consolable the patient is was absolutely invaluable. Chris, uh, I wanna get your, your honest opinion uh, on this specific uh, pediatric emergency assessment, just your, your global impression of, uh, of this scene itself and how do you engage and interact with it? So actually, whenever I was doing the demos with this, um, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed was the pediatric component, um, just because it is so hard to try to get students, either initial or continuing education students to understand and, and, and understand the terms of consolability and consolability. Uh, how do you assess what that PDS, the, the PAT? And when I was watching this and I was interacting with the, with the program, I was like, man, this is awesome. You know, I mean, to be able to get that immediate feedback from, okay, we're going to check for consolability. The mom picks the baby up and either they calm down or they didn't. And then, and then you can go back and look straight down at that child and see, are there retractions? Is that skin truly modeled? Is, are, is there cyanosis? You know, uh, what do, you know, what do the breath sounds actually sound like, you know, as they're breathing, as you're standing there and getting that across the room impression on, on your child um, that we always try to teach in school. You're like, Hey, we, you have to get that across the room impression of any patient, either adult or pediatric. But when you can walk in and say, Oh, well, there's a child there. Oh, they do have retractions. I can see the retractions. Oh, I can hear the audible wheezing or the croup or the, the stratorous breathing, you know, all of those things that you just can't teach with a mannequin. And we actually had, I had the ability to have and design uh, as when I was the director of, a, of an EMS education program in Dallas, we designed some really awesome, you know, lab rooms and realistic lab rooms, but we still didn't have any way to get a patient to look like that. I mean, like Greg was saying, it's hard to get a, a 22 year old, you know, healthy fireman uh, to lay there and look like an 80 year old or a two year old. And, but with these programs, I mean, that, that was great, you know, and if I could take that, that, uh, didactic portion of the class, give them the education and then turn right around and say, okay, let's go to the lab room and use the VR to immediately reinforce that. I mean, that's invaluable. Thank you, Chris. Greg, um, if you're putting a program together that is, uh, that features VR, how do you construct the curriculum? My personal idea would be, you mentioned a little bit about cognitive uh, front loading, how you would build that curriculum. What I would do is uh, probably charge the students with learning some specific tasks on their own time, some brief didactics, followed by a VR uh, component, uh, a practicum. How would you build that curriculum that features, say, a pediatric emergency assessment uh, module? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you, you have to front load them with the didactic portion as we do with any of our trainings um, in whatever medium you choose to deliver that in person or self-study. Um, and where I, I, the way I would see incorporating the VR is, and one of the really cool things that VR does is um, you have to know what normal looks and sounds and acts like, right? So uh, one of the challenges with just throwing right into a mannequin or uh, again, for rural agencies that maybe can't afford high fidelity uh, pediatric mannequins, we oftentimes go pull videos off the internet. Well, we're always pulling videos of sick kids uh, and they're usually in a hospital bed already and they've got feeding tubes and IVs and potentially innovated already to show what retractions and stuff. And you can almost pre-program people um, uh, to every kid sick, every kid sick. And of course we want to be diligent, but you also need to know what not sick looks like. And I was really pleased when I jumped into the, the pediatric training that I had a scenario where the kid was, uh, was, was okay. Uh, and I got to see what a normal kid uh, looks like, what normal breathing looks like, what normal skin looks like. Um, and so I think you start out uh, it, with the training of where they're seeing some, some relatively stable 
patients. And then you, um, as Kathleen alluded to earlier, you start ramping up the severity. You don't just immediately start out with worst case scenario. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I fully agree with you. That would be the way that I would do it. I think a, a modern program, a state-of-the-art program that features a multimodal way of doing things, um, that is how we're going to teach our, our next generation of learners how to be really elite at what they're doing uh, pre-hospital. Um, Kathleen, I, I'm going to show uh, a clip right now. Uh, you spoke about delivery practice, and a lot of these concepts, we're going to be saying them over and over and over again, because they're so important and we want our audience to be familiar with them. And so um, part of uh, deliberate practice is kind of how you give that feedback, the way it's uh, given, the way it's integrated into the learning. So Danielle, if we could show the, the clip uh, on the pediatric emergency assessment on explanation being given to the, um, to the crew. Um, and then, uh, Kathleen, I'd like you to kind of discuss uh, what your thoughts are and how deliberate practice is utilized within, um, within this environment. Notice the retractions, flaring, and gasping that are all signs of abnormal work of breathing. He is pale, best identified at the perioral and palmar regions, mottled and cyanotic, best identified at the perioral area, hands and feet, and he has delayed cap refill. Together, this assessment demonstrates cardiopulmonary failure. In cardiopulmonary failure, you should position the head, open the airway, and initiate ventilation. You should also begin chest compressions immediately at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute if the heart rate is less than 100, and get IV or IO access, check glucose, and initiate cardiac monitoring. So Kathleen, when, uh, when uh, you have a, a verbal cue, an explanation be, being given to you kind of in real time as you're doing the procedure, what are your immediate thoughts on how the feedback is, is given? Is it a good idea to do it in real time like they're doing it here? Is it better to give the feedback after, after the session? What are your honest thoughts on how feedback is given within the environment? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, walking, uh, allowing somebody to kind of make the decision, land on a decision, and then receive feedback at right at the time of that decision is where you're getting the opportunity to provide the, the, um, the grounding of the information. If somebody goes through a series of different things, and then at the end of six or seven scenarios gets a score, of you did well on three and then you didn't do well on two, some of that opportunity for understanding what they did at the time is really lost um, because it's hard to kind of remember why they made the decision that they did. Um, so I think that the, the feedback really uh, is key at that point. And when I uh, was able to kind of do the PAT demonstration, um, I noticed that uh, there were a couple of interesting key things to, to think about. One was, as uh, Greg had uh, alluded to, there was a normal kid. The normal kid was very tachycardic, um, a heart rate of 180, um, but a normal respiratory rate not modeled, was consolable. And I think that when um, people see a child with a heart rate of 180, they think there must be something wrong, but a heart rate of 180 in a young toddler who's distressed and crying and maybe even has a little fever is actually pretty common. And the feedback given um, in, this, uh, in this training module um, is uh, very clear on that. And that I think is really important to ground people in. I think um, often a heart rate over 150 becomes SVT in most people's minds, um, but it's not true in kids. And so that was, I thought, one of the really nice teaching points of it. The other thing that um, I wanted to mention about the pediatric assessment triangle, uh, if you give me a little indulgence, when it was first developed um, by uh, Marion Gaucher Hill and Dina Brownstein um, and Ron Diekman years and years ago for PEP, it was really about sick, not sick. And, um, and that was adopted by the AHA for PALS to be sick, not sick. But what further research has shown is that depending on which sides of the triangle are involved, it actually gives you different physiologic constructs. 
And I think that that is a really beautiful um, a development of how the PAT can be used. And this training helps people land in those constructs and those six to, you know, categories of like, is it a metabolic process? Is it a neurologic process? Is it a respiratory process? Um, is it a cardiogenic process? I think is really important because as we talked about before, it starts to narrow the learner into understanding what category of algorithm they're gonna to need to pursue. And for particularly for kids and particularly in EMS, um, there is a struggle to figure out what protocol they really need to be on and what they need to be treating. And this has been a really beautiful evolution of the utility of the pediatric assessment triangle in a way that um, I don't think we're traditionally teaching. Um, and I think we just go, this is the PAT, sick, not sick. And then people go sick and then we move on and we're not really thinking about why they're sick. So thank you for letting me expand upon that beyond uh, what you were probably asking, but I think that that's kind of a key thing to take away about how this can be important in the training. Kathleen, as our in-house uh, pediatric emergency medicine subject matter expert, you can have all the time in the world. Uh, this, this is an important topic. Pediatrics is, is a challenge for every single EMS program around the world. Um, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, by the way, one of the things that I really liked about the pediatric uh, assessment triangle within the environment is uh, Greg alluded to uh, the fact that everything is voice prompted. So you can choose things within the triangle uh, all by voice and it highlights it for you. And, and the program can make an assessment on your performance based strictly on, on voice. So there's uh, uh, the, the adaptability of this program to uh, allow for different ways of interacting with the environment is absolutely phenomenal in my opinion. I'm going to switch gears uh, just a little bit. Um, Chris, one of the things that uh, we, you and I live in a, in a metroplex that is very diverse, um, uh, kind of a melting pot of sorts, and it's going to soon be that way throughout the United States and, and the world. One of the things that I really liked about what uh, this environment provides is, um, is that there's quite a bit of diversity. The demographics are, are changing. Talk to me a little bit about how you have seen the demographics of both your learners and patients. You get to write out with, with the medics and I get to practice patients. Tell me a little bit about the demographics changing uh, in your opinion. So as far as the learner's demographics, you know, I think it's uh, just as much generational as it is, um, you know, as far as the diversity change um, and the ethnic change, um, you know, 10 years ago, there was less technology involved. You know, there, you know, the students had some technology base in their just their gym environment. But if you go to a, a program now and you pick an EMT or a paramedic student, and you know, if you're having trouble with your computer or your laptop or something like that, or the or the just the general tech of your of your classrooms, you can just go pick a student out of the class and they can probably run it better than you. And so by utilizing these VRs, you know, this is their world. This is where they live. But what I've also found and probably what is the most difficult is to get these folks to speak to somebody because, you know, you're walking into somebody's home that you've never met before in your life. And you're about to have some of the most intimate commerce conversations that you've ever had with anyone. And you don't know how to do that. And because of these generational changes, the, the people are just less likely to have that face-to-face -face conversation. Now, if you were to give each person a cell phone and tell them to text each other the conversation, they could probably work right through an EMS call without a problem. But when you start talking about that face-to-face -face interaction, that's lost. And so by having something like this involved, you know, again, you can go back to the didactic force and teach all these folks everything you need to go or teach and then go straight to the, the classroom and, or the, the lab room and utilize this VR environment to basically force them into that conversation. And, you know, kind of like what Greg was saying, it's like you have to be able to tell Andre to turn off that TV or Sonia to, you know, charge that monitor or, you know, Aaron to start an IV for you, as opposed to just staring at your, you know, your lab partner to hope they'll do it for you. You know, you're forced to have those conversations. And, um, and then so when you do go out and you are able to speak from, you know, the current generation into somebody that was, you know, 85 years old, that's not used to having that conversation, but they're also still very stoic. 
you can basically get them to kind of force that conversation out to begin that and get over that very, you know, um, uncomfortable silence that you see with a lot of students. Because, you know, when you're using the pediatric assessment triangle or you're using OPQRST or sample, you give a student that and they zip down those six or seven questions. And then all of a sudden they just stop and everybody's just staring at each other because they'd have no idea to have a conversation. And, um, and, but now by having VR, you face, you basically force them to do that. And so it helps kind of, uh, bring the gap of the, of the generations together and hopefully make the students just better once they hit the, hit the streets, as well as the current people that are out there for continuing education. It's the same thing, you know, cause once they get on the streets or get in the stations, they, you know, they still have the same problems. It's just a little less as it was in, in school. So there is definite diversity, not just culturally, ethnically, there is also, um, uh, educationally and generationally, there's, there's a lot of things that VR can, can address, you know, and so this specific module does a phenomenal job of addressing things like cognitive bias. In my opinion, one of the, the greatest attributes of this module, as we mentioned um, at our meeting last week, was that it also addresses things like racial bias. You know, the demographics of our uh, clinicians, our EMS professionals out there are changing. So, Danielle, let's uh, show the, um, the ACLS um, and a, a team makeup uh, clip, if you don't mind, where we show um, all the clinicians within the environment showing their names, et cetera. I think this was one of the best things that, uh, that this module brings to the table. And then we'll discuss a little bit about the uh, nuances. Jose, I'm Jose, and I'll be handling airway management. I'm Sonia, and I'll be working the defibrillator. I'm Andre, and I'll be doing chest compressions. Hi. I'm Erin, and I'll administer any medications. I'm Maria, and I'll be doing chest compressions. Greg, I um, I imagine that in certain parts of uh of the world, particularly where you've practiced, a recruitment of EMS personnel may be really tough, and uh, we really owe it to ourselves and our crews to be as uh, diverse as we possibly can. Learn about different cultures, uh, how somebody looks is different, the way they speak might be different. Talk to me a little bit about recruitment and how VR can can help us bridge uh, that gap potentially. Absolutely. Uh, again, uh, especially trying to recruit volunteers um, or trying to recruit um, even career staff in more rural agencies. Um, it's just human nature to be more comfortable um, if you have the opportunity to experience uh, whether that's training or uh, initial trainings with uh, familiar faces. And uh, traditionally being fire-based EMS systems, uh, traditionally we, we tend to be white male dominated uh, uh, as a profession, although that's rapidly changing. Um, and so whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's ethnicity, um, even to the point of um, accents uh, and potential language challenges and, and being able to do that uh, in VR to make people feel more comfortable and meet them where they're at, as opposed to saying, well, you just need to come fit in with us. Absolutely, 100% agree. And just like uh, our learner's demographic is changing, the patient demographics are changing even more rapidly. And in the future, I would like to see uh, integration of VR into some professional aspects of EMS care delivery. For example, how do you interact with a uh, patient who does not speak English, but may have a family member? You know, how much information you divulge? or how to utilize uh, professional interpreter services. So the possibilities are absolutely endless. And I was just very happy to see this featured in, in this specific module. As we start wrapping up, um, not to bring the, uh, the mood down, but um, uh, the module is not perfect. There are things that we could be uh, doing better in, in education. And certainly uh, there are areas in which virtual reality may not be a, a suitable uh, modality to teach our our learners. Kathleen, off the top of your 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 head, can you think about any areas that perhaps VR is is not primed to be a, a good modality for for learners? If you don't have any, that's okay. I uh, just wonder to see if you had any. 
Yeah, I no, I think that um, there are some interesting things that VR can do um, and even expand upon, which I'll touch on in a second. But the big thing is that, as you know, Craig or Greg has kind of alluded to multiple times that there, you can front load the cognitive training so that when you do get into the room and you, you have the opportunity to start practicing your actual psychomotor skills. Um, I think that, you know, one thing that you can see with VR from a research standpoint is, you know, where does gaze land in a room and to get a better sense of what learners are looking at and, and seeing, but the actual ability to kind of physically do uh, bag mass ventilation or do intubation or put in the IV or uh, do the physical chest compressions, which is really key for uh, you know, chest recoil and, um, and rate and things like that, you, you have to actually do, be physically hands-on and, um, and you're not getting that direct opportunity um, with VR. So I think skills is important. Um, pediatric skills um, is something that the EMS for Children program has been focusing on. And it's an important performance measure on frequency that um, EMS professionals are getting the opportunity to do skills check with their actual equipment. So pulling the right size bag, the right size mask, um, the right size um, equipment is really key for kids because um, one size does not fit all um, in children. And, um, and figuring out where that equipment is in your bag uh, is also kind of an example of where people actually have to physically be doing it, um, that VR can't necessarily replicate. Um, but I think the one thing I was just thinking through is we were um, discussing things and I think getting to Greg's other point about crew resource management is if, you know, I, I think about the technology and, and I'm not a gamer, I'm, you know, a 50 year old female. Uh, and, but I think, you know, people are on the internet, um, you know, doing video games with people across the country. You can have multiple um, EMS professionals as a team, all with an Oculus that can then, you know, in almost a gaming sense, have them work together. Right when you are right now in the in this, you are working with a team that is within the virtual reality world, but you could actually start doing this with your own team, where you're practicing communication, close of communication, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of an interesting potential advance. But I can't stress enough the critical importance of the actual hands-on component. And in some uh, multiple studies that have looked at hands-on stuff happening and particularly around medication errors and things, procedural errors occur at a baseline of about 20 to 30%. Just it doesn't matter what cognitive tool you're using, whether in kids you're using a Brazil tape, a hand heavy tape or, or any other kinds of uh, cognitive aid, you're physically making a mistake 20% of the time. So you, in order to combat that, you need the hands-on. And that's where VR may not really be bridging that, that piece of the gap. Fully agree with you. I think it could be a phenomenal adjunct to what you're doing. Uh, even use it as a standalone didactic, uh, if you'd like. Nothing will ever replace um, hands-on. Maybe some technology will uh, come down the line, which we could uh, actually do kind of hands-on stuff in the virtual environment um, that is uh, affordable. Uh, but for the time being, this, this is going to be a, a good really adjunct. Chris, I, uh, we only have a, a minute or two left, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so I'll give you the, the last uh, question. Do you personally foresee this tool being valuable in, um, for a, an audience that is not singularly uh, captive, meaning that you can't engage every single person in the room exactly the same as a person next to them. Do you think this could be a, a really good tool for, for your type of audience in the environment you teach at? Actually, um, what I was going to say, probably not a hundred percent, but then I, when Dr. Adelgaze was saying, you still need those psychomotor skills. It always, I mean, just something just triggered me and I was sitting there thinking, well, yeah, actually we could because I would have Gil running the VR event and then because obviously the folks that are outside of that can't see the VR event itself. And I would just have them say, okay, uh, Chris, I need you to start drawing up medications. Greg, I need you to start putting them on the monitor. Uh, Dr. Adelgaze, I need you to start, you know, uh, you know, do, doing an IO. 
and they can still do this the psychomotor part of it i'm the instructor i'm standing back watching everything anyway and i can actually physically see them do the skills but the the vr experience is being ran by that single person so they can be graded on the vr experience and i can still have my folks that are outside of that that mask do the uh skills and watch them physically drop the medications or watch to make sure they're doing the adequate depth on compressions on a mannequin because you can still you know kind of you know, dual purpose everything you still have your high fidelity mannequins and still have vr and so at first i was sitting there kind of struggling with the fact that i probably couldn't and then all of a sudden it just kind of dawned on me yeah i can i mean i can set up a skill station any way i want to and then just you know kind of merge and marry both environments the high fidelity you know skills sitting in front of me and the virtual reality component by the person being the team leader on the in the code thank you so much chris i fully agree with you it's hard to get a singularly captive audience and uh, this allows us to engage learners uh, despite the, any gap in, in age or or training it really allows us to immerse them in in the same environment uh, and tailor the, the training to, to their level. I think uh, this is a phenomenal tool. I would like to thank uh, all of the, the panelists um, today, uh, Chris, Greg, and Dr. Adogase. Uh, this has been a, a really valuable opportunity for me as, uh, as an educator. And I will uh, go out line and say that um, I've been a big, um, very passionate about virtual reality and augmented reality for a while. And this has been one of the better products uh, that I've seen uh, over time. And I don't, I don't take that uh, comment lightly. So thank you so much uh, once again to the panel. Thank you to Health Scholars and thank you to uh, Career Cert for the opportunity. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much.